As you heard, I'm Eric Nelson. I'll be facilitating these first and third Tuesdays, both virtually and uh, in person here at uh, the Prince of Peace Church on Millam Road. If you ever want to come uh, to the face-to-face -face group, you're really welcome to do that. And I don't have a, a clear plan for how this is going to flow over the next months. My idea is that I will be integrating some new stuff each time, but I'll also be kind of giving some basic instruction at the beginning because I never know when new people are coming in, but I will try to make it progressive over the coming months. And then of course the retreats I'm gonna be doing, I'm hoping to do on a quarterly basis if that works out for everyone's calendar. So that's an opportunity to um, go a little deeper and get uh, more in-depth instruction. And it's possible I might actually do some full, some actual classes in the community. Uh, I just don't know, maybe towards next fall, I'm not certain yet. Um, but we'll be continuing this, this type of thing. And you can get a fair amount of instruction. Uh, if you have registered online, we have your email. So we'll be sending you uh, some follow-up materials. Uh, I've got a, I think it's a five week uh, course uh, it's a PDF and it's five lesson plans for basic uh, mindfulness practice. So we can send that out to you and you can use that to guide yourself if you wanna go a little deeper uh, and a little quicker. Um, but um, tonight we'll, I'll give a little introduction and um, we'll do some practice. So first of all, uh, for the, those of you that are online and here, how many have done some mindfulness practice and are kind of somewhat familiar with mindfulness? Okay, uh, um, how many practice, this is, you don't have to answer this question, but um, how many people can levitate? No, that's the wrong question, I'm saying, <laughs> that's more advanced. Um, how many people uh, practice once, maybe once a week? Or once or more a week? Okay. How many people wish they practice more than once a week? <laughs> okay, so we've got, you're, you're somewhat familiar, good, okay. Um, never hurts to do a little review. So what I've been finding through my own practice, mindfulness is one piece of um, contemplative path. Uh, the other piece that is important and we'll do tonight is concentration practice. Uh, sometimes people uh, don't focus on the concentration and that um, really inhibits your capacity to be mindful. I'll talk about that. And then the third piece, so you have concentration, mindfulness, and compassion practice. Uh, we will do just a little bit, very uh, limited compassion practice. I'll focus on that in, in future um, evenings, uh, but we'll do just a little bit. So those three are important to integrate. And I'll speak a little bit to um, the concentration dimension and the mindfulness dimension. So as many of you know, you know, the value of doing these practices is aimed at, you know, enhanced well-being, uh, supposedly a little less stress in our lives. Um, we can kind of lower our reactivity towards others, lower our judgment towards others, and especially reducing our judgment to ourselves. So the re reducing judgment to ourselves connects to that area of self-compassion and then judgment of others, compassion towards others, empathy and compassion towards others. So what else is of value with this? I think what I've learned is that I take my own story of me and how the world should be a little less seriously. I don't hold on to my opinions as strongly as, as I once did, um, realizing that my opinion, my assumptions, my preferences are conditioned by the life I've led, the circumstances I've led, and to project those perspectives on others and thinking others should align with that is a recipe for a lot of disappointment and frustration um, and probably not real healthy interpersonal relationships, especially. So how do we practice then 
doing individual practice like we're doing tonight is helpful. But then how do we bring that into our day-to-day -day life is, is the challenge. And I think um, this is something I'm still working on, but getting up in the morning and having an intention towards the day to be our best selves, to be to notice our patterns of reactivity, to maybe commit to connecting in all our relationships to ourselves and others through uh, a lens of openness, kindness, curiosity can help to kind of set the tone for a way of being in the world that um, aligns with these practices. Um, ultimately, we're seeing that a strong separate sense of self, a strong ego identity, while it's important to develop that, as we mature, it's also important to then soften that and not hold on to it so tightly. And that's what these practices really aim at as we begin to see that the sense of a real solid separate sense of self is rather an illusion. And we are really uh, deeply interconnected in all of, you know, with the earth, with the food we eat, the air we breathe on a physical level. And then on a relational level, our family, our friends, all the people in this world now uh, with the complex world we live in, we're dependent on you know, our power, our food, our roads, you name it. It's just a, a million people out there who are doing various services and not, don't forget the IRS, it's coming up. And the IRS who keeps us uh, our roads uh, paved and all that, collecting taxes. So we're deeply interconnected with this web of life. So this sense of uh, being an isolated self is, um, is really uh, an illusion to a great extent. And there's practices to help us connect uh, with one another, with the earth. Again, that connects with the compassion practices. So I thought I would share, there's a book I've used in the past, the Mindful Way Workbook. And we have one more person waiting to be admitted. Um, and this workbook lays out, you know, let's do that. This workbook lays out um, eight principles, and I'll read through them, and it kind of gives an overview of the contemplative uh, approach and the mindset that goes with it. The first um, level is called, most of us live on autopilot, and that's the dominant mode of our kind of our doing mode. We're on autopilot, we tend to react out of habitual um, information from the past and projecting that into this moment. And with mindfulness, we shift from just automatically reacting to the present moment, largely based on past memory, and often it's unconscious. We attempt to move into more of a conscious awareness and conscious choice. So we may notice how the judgmental analytical mind comes up, the automatic pilot, and makes some judgment on the present moment. But as we develop the capacity to notice that, we can pause and decide whether that's a, the appropriate response or maybe we should connect to a little more curiosity, a little more openness, and explore more of what's really going on as opposed to just relying on you know, past assumptions uh, and perspectives that may not fit in this moment. So moving from autopilot to more of a conscious awareness and choice in our, for, towards ourselves and in our relationships. And then the next one is about relating to experience through thought versus directly sensing experience. And this is again, similar to the first one that uh, we tend to relate to what's happening through the analysis of what we're looking at through a judgmental mind, as opposed to just being open, curious and inviting of that information. I'll read what they talk, how they describe this. In this direct sensing mode, we connect with life directly we sense it, we experience it, we know it intimately by close acquaintance. We get a taste of the richness and ever-shifting wonder of the experience of life. And I think we might, you know, maybe we experience that sometimes when we travel. You know, when we're in a new place, uh, it's all new and uh, it's so new that maybe we don't even have a context for judging it. 
and we just have to be receptive and open. And it can be very powerful to be in that mindset and receiving new experiences. And it can be very uplifting because it's, it's, uh, it's vital and new. A third level um, of moving from the doing to a being mode, we tend to, when we're in the head, we tend to dwell on and in the past and in the future. We can have a lot of happy members of, uh, memories of the past. We can also have a lot of regrets and shame about the past. And we can replay those over and over, which you know content, typically re-traumatizes us. Or the future, again, we can have um, cat catastrophizing the fruit future. What if this happens? What if that happens? Or we can just get lost in making grandiose plans for what could happen. And that takes can take up most of our day of living in the past and living in the future. Whereas with mindfulness, we attempt to come more and more into the present moment, being with what we're doing in that moment. Um, in, the, in this being mode, the mind is gathered here now in this moment. We're fully present and available to whatever is occurring. We can have thoughts about the future, memories about the past, but crucially, we experience them as part of our present experience. We witness them without being drawn into the past or future worlds uh, with the thoughts that might otherwise, the thoughts they might otherwise create. And the fourth area, and then we'll move into practice here in just a minute. Um, in this doing mode, we can have this need to avoid, escape, or get rid of unpleasant experiences versus approaching experiences with interest. And this is a, a large part of, in the Buddhist teachings, um, they speak to, about craving, and craving can be wanting pleasant or craving for unpleasant things to go away. So craving has a, a dual dimension to it. And Again, when we're wanting, well, in this case, to escape, we're saying to the world, what is right now? We don't want it to be that way. But in truth, whatever's happening is, is what it is. Our wish for it to be different is not going to change the circumstances. So this is also relates to this idea of, of suffering, that the more we resist an unpleasant experience, the greater our suffering. Unpleasant experiences are a given, and if we can relate to them, as they say here in this being mode, the basic response is to approach all experiences, even the unpleasant, with interest and respect. There's no setting of goals for how things should be or should not be. Rather, there is a natural interest and curiosity in all experiences, whether it is pleasant, unpleasant, or just neutral. And that's a hard one. I mean, it's in a way, this is a, a fairly major shift uh, in what our biology tells us to do, that if something is unpleasant, our natural tendency um, our, is to move away from it. But in these practices, whether the unpleasant experience is physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, or, or difficult thoughts, um, we take, we develop the courage to hang out with them and see what's really going on. And typically what we do in the practices is if we have overwhelming thoughts, emotions, um, we notice them in the body. We don't analyze them. We don't try to figure the thoughts or emotions out, but we simply relate to how is that thought or emotion manifesting physically in the body? Is there tightness in the chest or the jaw or difficulty breathing or whatever it might be? And that simple practice of coming to the present moment with the actual experience interrupts the ruminative mind, which is cat typically cat making a cat you know, catastrophizing uh, whatever emotion or difficult thought is happening. We interrupt that feeding process of those thoughts and emotions and just rest in the present moment of experience. And in that mode, the nervous system uh, which was probably before, if it's an unpleasant experience, it might be more in a threat, a stress response. It settles, the nervous system can come to a soothing place, and we can make wiser decisions. So that's a lot of what we're understanding through these practices is anytime we're caught into a heavy drive state, going after goals blindly, or fearful, pushing things away that are unpleasant, we don't 
uh, have access to our full intelligence. We're very limited. The mind is only looking through that either pleasant or drive lens and looking for information that um, uh, amplifies that or reaffirms that state of mind. When we drop into the soothing state, we can see both those poles. We can see the drive state, but we can also see maybe there's some, some negatives to that. And we can make a choice, is, is the goal worth the, the cost that's going to happen? So we can make wiser decisions. Um, let's see if there's any more. I think that's probably enough for now. So let's, since we're recording, I won't, normally I would ask for questions, but we'll wait until after the practice. So hold your questions. You can, I, I'll say a little bit more and to re-stimulate our conversation, we can start that up after our practice. So tonight what I'll do is I'll give a, uh, a basic practice of um, breath awareness, uh, some body awareness practice, and um, that'll include some concentration practice, some mindfulness practice, and then I'll probably close with a brief loving kindness practice, very brief. So I'll be guiding this. If my voice is too much, you can turn your volume down if you're just in the zone and have it be more of the background. But I'll try to not speak too much, but I'll give enough a guidance that uh, will hopefully keep you on track. And in the process of doing this, the guidance will give you kind of a blueprint for a certain type of practice. This is um, based on um, a Sangha's uh, method. It's a nine, nine uh, point meditation practice. And it's uh, been well developed over the centuries and um, has been quite effective in, in developing people's uh, concentration, mindfulness, and, and tranquility, insight meditation. So if you want to just get comfortable, and what are we at? We're here at about 25 after, so we'll take about a half an hour for practice. <clears throat> Get a cheat sheet out here. I don't know if I've used this or not. So this um, method that I'm using comes out of the Mind Illuminated book. And that's something I probably can send. I've sent it to some people, but anybody who signed up online will be sending you some materials. And I can send you a link to that book if you want to have a deep dive. It's about a 400-page book, and it's quite comprehensive. So just get, find a comfortable position in your chair, or if you're lying down, that's fine as well. And the essential thing we'll be doing here as we do this practice is, is being very relaxed, but also alert at the same time, and I'll guide us in there. So just becoming aware of the body, feet are flat on the floor, hands can be either in the lap or towards the the waist or out on the knees, wherever it's comfortable for you. It can be helpful to have the hands back a little bit from the knees just to open up the shoulders so you can breathe easily. And just noticing contact points right now with the body. Contact of the feet on the floor. Noticing the sits bones in the chair. When I say notice, I'm me, I mean being with sensations in that experience of contact between the chair and the sits bones. So maybe there's hardness, softness, cool, warm. And sensing into the back now. And I'm just going to tap the bolt with the bell here. You may not hear it too much online. 
begin our practice. I'll walk us through a couple steps that are called preparation for meditation. These will be in the book that I will send you by email in the Mind Illuminated. So it's suggested that we first, prior to actually doing the practice, check into our motivation. So you review your purpose for meditation today and just be honest with yourself. Don't judge whatever the reasons are. And maybe it's, I just want more peace of mind. So just checking in with your motivation for being here tonight. And then thinking about goals, what might you hope to work on tonight? You know, setting a reasonable goal. Maybe it's simply to notice when the mind wanders or to notice when you judge yourself and to be able to let that be and let that go, whatever it might be for you. So that's a general direction, but then it's important to check our expectations. And we really want to let go of expectations. Be gentle with yourself. Just find enjoyment in this meditation, whatever comes up, whether pleasant, unpleasant. There's no bad meditation. We're primarily learning to be with the mind, the emotions, and the body with, with openness and kindness without judgment. So whatever happens, happens. And we can learn by just noticing the movements, fluctuations of mind, emotions, and body. That's we're kind of like a, a interior research lab learning about how this mind and body work together. And then just resolving to stay diligent in the practice tonight. So you, if boredom sets into this, you know, bring a little more energy and stick with it as best you can. And finally, just acknowledging anything that might be weighing on the mind. Maybe there's something that's happened this week or this year or long ago that still weighs on the mind that might distract us. And we acknowledge those weighty things that the mind can become occupied with and distracted by. We recognize them and let them know that they're important. And for right now, they can rest for the next half an hour. They can take a break and we'll get to them later. So they get a, to take a breather here tonight. Then finally, this checking posture. Back is straight, feet are flat on the floor. Chest is open. Eyes can be closed if you'd like. Maybe tipping the chin down. The head down slightly so we're not looking back, which can strain the neck. The mouth can be slightly open if you want so that the te teeth are not clenched. And we then will begin our practice now by just becoming aware of sensations in the body. Noticing areas of contact, pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, areas of soft, softness, areas of tightness. And then opening the attention to the whole, to the room that you're in. 
So there's a sense of including the space, both the objects and the space within the room that you're sitting, along with awareness of your body, sensations in the body. And we're just resting in this open, spacious quality of awareness, of attention. Just resting. Now we shift the attention just to the body again, just noticing sensations in the body and just noticing wherever sensations in the body draw attention and just being with that movement of sensation or just sensing the body as a whole and resting in that experience. Just resting. Maybe moving the attention up into the head area, into the face, and just noticing if there's any tension in the forehead, around the eyes, the cheeks, the jaw, and just inviting full face, the jaw, the neck, shoulders to soften, soothe, and rest. Soften, soothe, and rest. Combine the shoulders, the arms, and the hands. Soften, soothe, and rest. Soften, soothe, and rest. Sensing in the back and the hips, chest and the belly. Dying the whole upper body to soften, soothe, and rest. Soften, soothe, and rest. Find the hips, the thighs, the knees, the calves, the shins, ankles, feet, and toes, the whole lower legs and feet. Soften, soothe, and rest. Soften, soothe, and rest. Just resting in awareness of the sensations of the body. Now in this state of directing attention towards the body, well, we call that the foreground attention, but we're probably also aware of experiences in the background, sounds, thoughts, emotions. And that's fine. We don't have to push that away. They can just kind of rest there in the background while lightly resting our primary attention on the sensations in the body. Now let's narrow the tension just a little bit more to help stabilize the tension. 
and bringing our attention into the abdominal area and just noticing the sensation of the rise and fall, the abdomen. And specifically noticing the whole cycle of in and out breath, but noticing the beginning of the in breath and the beginning of the out breath as we follow the sensation of the breath in the abdomen. Just making a slight noting there. So we're staying very attentive to the movement of the breath as we experience it through the sensations in the belly. Just softening and relaxing on each out breath. You may notice the mind wanders it occasionally or quite often. And the response when the mind wanders, this is what we've been doing here is using the conscious mind to focus attention on the object of the sensation of the breath. Mindfulness is that which is awake and alert to our experience. And it notices when the mind wanders. So when we wake up to the mind wandering, mindfulness has noticed that and is reminding us, oh, I want to be with the breath, my concentration. And in that moment of waking up and noticing the wandering attention, we congratulate ourselves for waking up. We want to reward ourselves when we notice that. And that'll help us reconnect back to the concentrated breath awareness more effectively. So we rest the tension, the beginning of each in and out breath, on the breath all the way in, all the way out. When we get lost in the wandering mind and wake up, we congratulate ourselves for mindfulness waking us up. And we come back to the object of attention with the breath in the abdomen. We do this over and over again. In the time, the mind stabilizes more and more. If you notice any quality of calmness or peace, connect to that and feel that inherent joy of even just a moment of quietude and just bring an inner smile into the mind and body, appreciating the power of just being resting attention in present moment awareness the power for this to heal the mind and the body.
Just continuing to be with the breath. Noticing the beginning of the in-breath, beginning of the out-breath, space in between breaths. Just resting in the present moment, sensation of the breath in the belly. The thought or emotion is very strong and it keeps coming back up. You can just be with that and feel it in the body and have that be your object of attention until there's kind of a sense of completion or dissolving. But if it's just a momentary distraction that comes up and goes, no need to attend to it. Again, we have this foreground attention on the breath. The background attention is still open and spacious. Content in the background through the thoughts, emotions, other senses can just come and go. I'll remain attentive to the foreground, attention on the breath and the belly. The attempt here is to can is to um, have continuous attention to the object on the breath all the way in, all the way out. You can even maybe notice particularities of the breath. There's a beginning and end to each breath. There's usually a tiny space between breaths, so we can really tune in to the moment by moment experience of the breath in the body and the belly. Just resting in the sensation of breath in the belly.
then pausing for a moment and just checking into the body. Maybe noticing the face or the shoulders, any areas where there's a sense of tightness or contraction. Just have a sense of breathing through those areas with the invitation to soften and rest. The body may or may not respond, but if the body's ready, there's that option to just soften and rest. The face, the jaw, the neck, shoulders. Soften, soothe, and rest. Shoulders, arms, and hands. Soften, soothe, and rest. Shoulders, the back, upper back, middle back, lower back, and hips. Soften, soothe, and rest. And invite the chest and the belly to soften, soothe, and rest. The hips, the thighs, the knees, soften, soothe, and rest. Calves, shins, ankles, feet, and toes. Soften, soothe, and rest. Returning attention back to the breath and the belly. Following the sensation of the breath all the way in, all the way out. Not controlling the breath in any way, it's just natural. Moving in its own pace. And now bring in the attention, if you'd like, up into the nose area. And we use this because as we quiet the mind and the body, sometimes it's a little difficult to follow the sensation in the abdomen and the belly. So we bring the attention to the sensations of the air going into the nose and out of the nose. Maybe there's coolness on the in-breath a sense of warmth or moisture on the out breath, whatever sensation, but this narrowing the attention to the nose itself to a very fine point of sensory awareness of the breath in the nose now. Just resting. The sensation of the breath all the way in, on the in breath, all the way out, on the out breath.
Just resting. Pausing, letting go, noticing any contractions in the body. Allowing those areas to soften, soothe, and rest. Soften, soothe, and rest. Soften, soothe, and rest. Then returning attention back to the breath and the nose. If you're experiencing kind of a busy mind and your eyes are closed, you can lower the gaze of the eyes just below horizon line, directing it downward slightly, that will calm the mind. If you're struggling with sleepiness, you can raise the eyes a little above horizon line, looking up slightly, that should bring a little more stimulus and energy to attention. Or if you're fine, you can just keep the gaze straight ahead. Looking down can calm the mind, looking up slightly can bring a little more energy, countering sleepiness or dullness. And then when you feel comfortable, you can just bring the gaze back to the center. It's the tool you can use in the midst of your practice. Continuing with the sensation of the breath and the nose. Now we'll attempt something. You can continue just with the sensation of the nose, but if you want, this is um a practice where we just notice awareness itself. So the object is dropped. So we're, we can notice ourselves noticing sensation of the breath in the nose. And just noticing what is that awareness that is awake to that noticing? What is the awareness itself that is watchful and alert? We're stepping back just a little bit, and we call this awareness of awareness. And don't try to conceptualize that because it'll trip you up. But just being awake to awareness itself, if you want to try that, and just resting in open, spacious awareness. that doesn't make sense or feels difficult, just continue with the breath and the nose. And that's just fine.
And just bringing the attention back into the upper body now, feeling into the belly and the chest. And feeling the breath in the chest and the heart area, bringing the attention there. We'll conclude with brief loving kindness practice. So this feeling into the area of the heart. Maybe just beginning by bringing into your mind's eye someplace in nature where you feel surrounded by beauty and safe and comfortable. Maybe it's in the mountains or maybe it's in your backyard, around the campfire, by a river, a lake, a desert, wherever it might be, looking up at the stars. And just opening your heart to the beauty and the joy of this natural space. Seeing this space through your eyes and taking in the joy, the colors, the textures, the light, the shadow, the patterns. Just inviting the beauty and joy of this space and its place into the heart. And just radiating that joy out to every cell of your body. Knowing that this earth with all its beauty is what this body is made of, of earth elements, the air, the water, the plants, the animals, the earth. Feel that connection and gratitude for that connection between this natural world, this mother earth, and this human body, this human form. Knowing that this human form is made up of countless bacteria and various elements that aren't really human, but sustain this life. So this body is made up of earth as much as it's made up of human cells. As we exhale moisture from the body, it moves up into the atmosphere, becomes clouds, which bring rain back down. And the cycle nourishes the body as we drink water, goes on and on. Each exhale we make feeds the plants, and the plants in turn feed us with fresh oxygen. This community of life that we participate in, just acknowledging that you're not separate alone at all. And even in these cells of ours, we have the memories of countless ancestors. We carry the past into the present. And we share this life with our relationships that will continue this life of ours into the future. Into the lives that we touch. And we wish ourselves kindness. May I be happy and joyful in this moment. May I be healthy in mind, and just reflecting on what that means, healthy in mind. May my mind be healthy. May my body be healthy. What does that mean to you? May my body be healthy. Just setting that intention. May my body be healthy.
May I be healthy and well-being and spirit, whatever that means for you. Some calls the spirit realm that which we understand as our connection to all things. A sense of interbeing, interconnectedness. May I know inner peace, my body and my mind. May I know peace in all my relationships, especially those that are difficult. And I see myself connecting to all my relationships, the difficult ones with kindness, with curiosity, with compassion. May I be free from suffering and free from the causes of suffering and just reflecting those things that bring suffering into your life. And maybe giving them the space to be healed. Those things that cause us suffering to maybe let them dissolve. I can float away to the past. You may see that they're no longer true for us, those things that get in our way and they can be healed and dissolved. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be peaceful. May I be free from suffering and free from the causes of suffering. And then finally extending this wish to all beings. May all beings be happy and joyful. Let's have a sense of radiating out this loving kindness from the heart in all directions in front of us, behind us, above us, below us, to the left, to the right, and I'll tap the bell and just imagine as these sound waves radiate out to infinity, our loving kindness travels on those waves. May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy, mind, body, and spirit. May all beings have inner peace and peace in the future. May all beings be free from suffering and free from the causes of suffering. It's concluding, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be peaceful, may I be free from suffering, may I live with ease, may I live with ease. It's touching into the quality of your awareness right now in the body, noticing the body, noticing the mind, thoughts, emotions. Or the lack of thoughts and emotions. Notice any joy, any sense of upliftment. Notice any unpleasant qualities. And just meet it all with that quality of curiosity, 
and kindness. Radical acceptance of what is in this moment with an open heart, open mind, compassionate heart for itself and others. And just connecting to any benefit that you may have touched here and just recognizing that this benefit is always present and available when we slow down and just touch our essential nature. Place of calm, quiet, abiding in the present moment. And just remembering that this is an benefit, the skill that we can bring into our daily life more and more. As we notice the habitual reactive mind, enough awareness to pause, enough self-awareness to pause, and with that self-awareness, the capacity to regulate, choose our response. And I would suggest that response that can be one of kindness to ourself and others will likely lead to greater peace and happiness and productive relationships with ourselves and others. Take a few deep breaths with your toes and fingers. About 45 minutes of practice. Most of it. A little longer than I anticipated. But yeah. If you open your eyes, you can kind of keep a, a, what I suggest, like a peripheral awareness. I have an awareness of the whole space of the room you're in. Mind tends to want to go quickly back to seeing objects and objects as separate from one another. With more peripheral awareness, we can kind of have a sense of the interconnectedness of the space around us. If there's anything I should read, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Mary Oliver, called The Messenger. My work is loving the world. Here, the sunflowers, there, the hummingbird equal seekers of sweetness. Here the quickening yeast, there the blue plums, here the clam deep in the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? Am I no longer young and still half perfect? Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. The rose, the daffodil, the sheep in the pasture, the pasture, which is mostly rejoicing since all the ingredients are here, which is gratitude to be given a mind and a heart, and these body clothes, a mouth with which to give shouts of joy, and to the moth and the wren, to the sleepy dug up clam, telling them all over and over, how is it? that we live forever. It reminds me of a teaching of Thich Nhat Hanh. He talks so much about um, how there is no birth, there is no death, because 
life this keeps on you know our i think as our cells die every seven years we just about have a full turnover in the cells so there's always death going on in our body and there's always rebirth going on in the body all the time and of course when the body dies if if we have a natural burial it feeds the earth and new life comes from that so there's no energy lost life this continues and he talks about how our also how our ancestors lived through us which Genetically, they do, and then through our memories, much more than we realize, probably. We even know through our psychology, intergenerational trauma can, can flow from generation as well as intergenerational joy <laughs> can flow as well. So this idea of a deep interconnectedness with life, a community of life, to me is really, for my own life, is becoming more and more essential in a world that can feel fairly divided and isolating. Um, and, you know, very materialistic. Um, it's easy to, you know, objectify the world as opposed to seeing the vitality. Anyhow, so I'll open it up to comments, questions. And if you want to stop recording, Deborah, you can.